This is John Amis talking about music from London. From London, yes, but it so happens that in this programme I'm the only Londoner. For we've got an Australian conductor, a Hungarian playing a rather rare instrument, and an Austrian publisher old enough to have some personal recollections of Gustav Mahler. First comes Charles McCarris, a conductor who is not only more versatile than any other that I know, but he's also unique in being accepted as versatile by the public at large. Who else is allowed by the public, managers, radio stations and so on, to be a symphonic conductor, a ballet conductor, an operatic conductor, a light music conductor, a specialist in Janacek operas, and a specialist in Baroque music, particularly Bach and Handel? Well, I can't think of anybody, so let's focus on Charles McCarris. He's talking to Ian Gillam. And we'll give him, first, a musical build-up, part of his own version of the Royal Fireworks music by Handel. Mr. McCarris, to start at the very beginning, where were you born? Well, I was born in Schenectady in the United States, but that is simply because my parents happened to be there at the time. My father was, a, um, was an apprentice engineer and was studying on a scholarship in Schenectady with the General Electric Company, but I am in fact entirely an Australian. As far as your formal musical education is concerned, where did that take place? Uh, well, learning the piano and composition and oboe and things like that, that was out in uh, Sydney, in uh, the Sydney Conservatorium. Um, and uh, then later, of course, when I came to England, which was after the war, I came to England and got a scholarship to uh, study in Czechoslovakia, in Prague. Um, this was a British Council scholarship, but this was my first chance to be able to really study conducting as such. And, um, of course, that was extremely useful for me. I uh, also had done a little bit of conducting in Australia before I came over here. Um, and also here, I started to do repetitoring and backstage conducting when I joined the Sadler's Wells Orchestra as an oboe player. I think it's fair to say that the first time you impinged upon the general consciousness in Britain, it perhaps wasn't as a conductor, but as a composer come arranger. This is certainly the first time I became aware of you with Pineapple Paul. How did this arrangement of Sullivan's music for a ballet come about? I'd um, often thought that uh, Sullivan's music would be very good to uh, make into a ballet, and um, I kept on imagining this, uh, this music treated like that, and I used to sit uh, week after week in the pit in the Theatre Royal in Sydney um, and think how nice it would be to arrange this music into a big symphonic uh, ballet, you know. It just happened to be a great piece of luck that the copyright on Sullivan's music ran out just at the time when it became possible to do this ballet at Sadler's Wells, and John Cranker, who was another very promising, also from, from, from not from England, he was from South Africa, of course, he, um, he and I quickly got together and, and arranged this thing, and um, of course it was very successful and particularly uh, suitable for the Festival of Britain. If I asked you to choose a favourite section from that, what would it be? Oh, it's very difficult to say. I spent, spent a great deal of time uh, arranging the finale with its sort of piling up uh, various can-can uh, tunes almost. <laughs>
I believe it was Wagner who said that if somebody wants to be a good conductor, he should also be a composer. Do you ascribe to this view as well? No, I think that it's uh, essential for um, conductors uh, to be able to compose something, however unoriginal it is. I mean, um, conductors must understand how composers think, I think, in order to be able to um, project themselves into the composer's uh, minds, they ought to be able to know what the process of composition is like, certainly. But there are many conductors who who compose music, but it's usually reminiscent of uh, other people. Uh, there are very few uh, really original composers um, who are chiefly conductors. Mahler, of course, was one, and uh, Bernstein is another one. I mean, Bernstein's music is uh, totally unlike the kind of thing he usually conducts. It's the same with Mahler. Uh, but mostly, um, the music written by conductors, uh, well, it, it can often be dismissed with the German term Kapellmeistermusik. That means uh, music composed by conductors, uh, which is, you know, you know stolen or rather <laughs> composed from memory, as they say. Is there any big difference which you'd point between the concert hall and the opera house? Well, of course, the opera house is far, far more uh, complicated. I mean, the very fact of uh, having to keep everybody together from such a widely spread out thing and the, uh, and the singers often uh, with their backs to the conductor or, or not actually watching the conductor the way everybody in the orchestra is and the singers having to do it all from memory and having to act and so on and there being offstage choruses and the acoustics of theatres are so different from each other and that that um, of course opera is a very very much more complicated form of, uh, of art and really the the conductor's job in an opera house is a great deal great deal harder but I must say I find it very challenging and very very um, interesting because I love opera so much I the very fact that, that it's so difficult to do the chances of doing a, uh, a good performance of an opera are really so slim you've got everything against you with a with an opera performance uh, a concert though um, well if you have a first-class orchestra it's uh, there's not a great deal to do. I mean, just let the music speak for itself, I find. Conductors who've got no experience of conducting in the opera house tend to, um, tend to make a great fuss, I think, of uh, conducting concerts and the effect they have on these orchestras and so on. But a lot of them should come into the opera house and see what uh, problems of conducting are really like. Now you are musical director of Sadler's Wells, which I should think is one of the most fascinating as well as the most challenging jobs in British music. Its policies have always been to have opera in English and to have English and Commonwealth singers. Are these policies which you'd like to see continued or not? Uh, yes, I do think so. I think it's very important to, that we should have a, uh, uh, an opera house which performs operas in English. The fact that there are now so many English singers, uh, so many first-class English and Commonwealth singers, uh, the, the restriction, as it's always been in Sadler's Wells, that only people with British passports are employed, is hardly a restriction at all, because, I mean, you can find first-class singers in, of every type uh, from English and Commonwealth. And I'll admit that, of course, uh, there are many people all over the world who think that uh, the, this uh, um, exclusive British attitude of, of Sadler's Wells is a bit uh, old-fashioned and rather silly. Uh, but I wouldn't like to change that policy. In fact, I don't think I alone could change it, even if I wanted to. But I wouldn't like to change that policy unless it became necessary. And as I say, at the moment, it's not necessary because there really are English singers um, or Commonwealth singers um, who can fit into any role. That was Charles McCarris talking to Ian Gillam. And now for our Hungarian playing a rare instrument. His name is Janos Liebner, its name is the baritone. Mr Liebner is scarcely less versatile than Charles McCarris because as well as being a virtuoso on the baritone, he's also a musicologist of repute, having written books on such different subjects as the baritone, naturally, and Verdi and Schiller, the two Macbeths, the Tempest and the Magic Flute. He's also been a cellist, a magazine editor, a music critic in his native Budapest, and artistic director of the State Opera in East Berlin, 
He's also a good linguist, as you can tell now when he talks about his own preferred and rare instrument. The baritone, or as it was called, viola de bardone, is a baroque instrument, probably of English origin, which is the only instrument of two techniques, of two families. It is a sort of combination of the viol, that is stringed family, and of the lute, that is plugged instrument family. The inventor was probably an English viol maker in the mid 17th century, who had the marvelous idea to combine these two then so popular and beloved musical families, the viols and the lutes. The baritone has seven strings to be played by the bow. which are tuned like those of the bass of viols, and 10 more strings behind the neck in a great open cavity, which are plucked by the left thumb. Usually, one plays the melody by the bow, and one accompanies it with the plucked strings. For example, a piece of Haydn. Now this combination of the gambas and the lutes produced this marvelous instrument, and there is a story about this English viol maker who is supposed to have invented this instrument, that when he built it, he simply didn't find a name for it. Then he got together with some of his colleagues, other viol makers, and one of these friends suggested some rather improper funny names for this instrument, which he uh, naturally resented. They got into a fight, and our viol maker struck the other one dead. Now he was uh, condemned to death, of course, and awaiting execution, when, as it happens in the tales and in the beggar's opera, the king heard about his marvelous invention, and he pardoned him. And now uh, this anecdote tells us that the word baritone comes from the word pardon. I don't know whether it's true or not, but it's a good story. Anyway, Haydn, who was the greatest composer of the baritone, spells the name either with a B and a Y, baritone, or with a P and an I, like peridon, which makes it possible that in his time the word Peridon was combined with the word pardon. Anyway, the baritone was born in the mid 17th century and uh, had a comparatively short existence. It went simply out of fashion at about the end of the 18th century. This short life was caused perhaps by the difficulties in playing this instrument. As I said, it needs a double technique, and a really good baritone player needs uh, three hands, because the left thumb works like a third separate hand, quite separately from the other four fingers. 
There are about 20 old instruments in the whole world today, baritones. Two or three of them, I'm not quite sure, are in London, in the Victoria and Albert Museum. One of these instruments is said to have belonged to Quantz, the flute master of Frederick the Great, who I've never heard that uh, played the baritone. Anyway, this instrument was his. The baritone was called in its time the instrument of kings and the king of instruments because many a crowned head played it as a favorite pastime. It was a sort of fashion in this time of the aristocracy to learn and play the baritone. The other known instruments today are partly in America, one in Michigan and one in Boston. One is in Paris and one is in Brussels. There are a few in Germany and in Austria. I think two are in Leningrad and uh, four in Prague. One is in Budapest and uh, there are a few others which are unknown. Anyway, there are very few of these instruments today and most of them are in museums unplayed. This one you hear now is not an original Baroque instrument but a modern copy made in Germany for me because I can't uh, travel with a so valuable, priceless original instrument. It's too delicate. I began to play on the Esterhazy baritone, which is preserved in the Budapest National Museum. And later on, when I began to travel with the instrument, I had one made for myself. was Janosch Liebner playing some more Haydn on the baritone. Haydn lived a lot of his life in Vienna, and our next speaker comes from there too. It's Dr Alfred Kelmus, a lifelong music publisher. A long life too, for Dr K, as we call him, he's well on the, in his 80s now. A delightful, bearded, patriarchal man. Especially associated with Universal Edition of Vienna who published the music of Mahler, Kodai, Bartok, Schoenberg, Webern and Berg. At Dr K's house in Wembley the other day, he showed me his visitor's book. There's one intriguing entry commemorating a dinner party at which Alban Berg and George Gershwin were fellow guests, and they got on very well with each other, he told me. They both left musical autographs, the Berg consisting, rather interesting, of a theme from an opera, Pandora, that never got beyond the planning stage. Anyway, here is a tape that I made with Dr Kalmus. I started by asking him who were the musical gods in Vienna when he entered the publishing business. It was in the first decade of this century. There was no god at all at that time. We had uh, acquired the uh, Eibel Verlag, with works by Richard Strauss. Uh, we have still in our catalogue a lot of songs and chamber music uh, and the violin concerto, etc. Also compositions by Reger, and then uh, works which then were very fashionable, uh, overtures by Soupé. Later, I left the Universal Edition for a short while in 1922, when I founded the Wiener Philharmonic uh, uh, Verlag, uh, which uh, published all the Philharmonia pocket scores, uh, which you probably know. Oh, yes. And then, yes. Hundreds of them. Uh, but I always I, thought that was part of uh, Universal Edition. That came back to Universal Edition oh, when I, I came back to it in ah. 1925. Hmm. And uh, 
then I met Richard Strauss and uh, he offered me the intermezzo. So I came to Strauss's villa in Vienna, which is very famous. I had to uh, clean my boots very carefully before I could enter. <laughs> And uh, then Strauss sat at the piano, at the upright piano, and uh, started playing to me the intermezzo. And this was very nice, and um, although I didn't like everything, but uh, of course Richard Strauss was a great personality, and so I was very much honored, I mean, that he played it to me. But then uh, I said, well, the conditions, you know, he was always with Fürsten in Berlin, but obviously they couldn't pay what he wanted, and so he thought perhaps I can. But I had a very small publishing house, the Philharmonia, and my means were rather modest. So he said, well, you see, I don't want more than 50,000 gold dollars, which you pay down for the royalties uh, for sales. But if you can give me then uh, a small royalties, I shall be very pleased. And the usual royalties for stage performances, etc. So I thanked him very much hmm. and I came home <laughs> and told my people, this I can't do. But that was an enormous amount of money, wasn't it? That was at that time. Well, 50,000 sovereigns, perhaps. Yeah. For an opera that really didn't have much success anyway. Yeah. Well, uh, this was the one opera which has no success, <laughs> or not very much success. You were very lucky then. Really. So I uh, was sorry, I mean, not to have it, but I mean, in these conditions I couldn't do it. Alfred, did you ever meet Mahler? Yes, I met Mahler. Um, I can tell you some, two stories of Mahler. Mahler was very short-sighted and had specs and uh, interested in everything. I mean, whatever came, I mean, the smallest detail, he jumped at it. And uh, he was uh, at our office, and suddenly there was some noise in the street, some cars crashed or something, and uh, people rushed to the window, and Marla too, to the window, but didn't see that the window was closed. And so he put his head through the glass <laughs> and uh, was of course then uh, very frightened but uh, nothing happened, he played a little but uh, it was uh, uh, significant for this man who was so keen quickly to grasp everything. Yeah. That was just when I entered Universal Edition and when I made catalogues, next to me it was a small room, next to me sat our editor and uh, uh, Mahler came repeatedly uh, to discuss uh, the corrections with verse of his Eighth Symphony. And so he stood just next to me, but he could never stand still. He always sat from one foot to the other because he was absolutely nervy and uh, excited with everything. Now one day he uh, came uh, from his home in the morning to Universal Edition and uh, he used the tram car. He had no, at that time, people hadn't got uh, uh, automobiles, so he used the tram car and was on the front platform. There was an open platform and uh, only a few houses from our office. And there the tram turned round the stock exchange. And Mahler, who was imp impatient, uh, he had uh, some kind of cloak only, you know, white cloak, loden, uh, this which you uh, wear in, in the mountains. And inside he had, uh, in a big roll, uh, the, all the proofs of the complete Eighth Symphony, corrected carefully, etc. But impatient as he was, he jumped uh, from the tram before it went round the bend. And at this moment, the whole uh, uh, proofs fell out of his pocket to the rails and were cut in two. 
Now you cannot imagine what unhappy man came to universal edition. <laughs> Tears in his eyes. Everything is ruined. My whole composition, I must now start again. I cannot read it again. It is impossible. He was so unhappy that I had to comfort him. And you looked at the whole thing. It was not very nice, but one could paste together all the pages. And very few places where the corrections were not visible. So he said, everything will be okay. We'll paste it together and you will not need uh, to read it anymore. Uh, leave it to us. He was radiant, marvelous. I, I still remember that because he always was, uh, he was, he was a naive man, you know, yeah. a real naive artist, a wonderful man. That was Dr. Alfred Kalmus telling the story of Marla and the tram car that was lucky not to be derailed. Anyway, that's the end of this Austrian, Hungarian, Australian edition of Talking About Music. We did think for a moment of pointing out Dr. Kalmus's story with a schizophrenic record of Mahler's Eighth Symphony in stereo, but with one speaker unplugged. But um, then again, we thought it was a bit too subtle. So instead, this is John Amos just saying goodbye from London. <laughs>